Today we'll be discussing import and export functionality as well as named regions. By the end of this training, it is my goal to help you all better understand key features in the endline system to make you all more efficient at either doing your job or training the users in each of your organizations. So this is talking about our CSV export functionality. It's very intuitive and simple to use. If you need to extract data from the endline system, the easiest way is going to be using the options in the export dropdown menu you see here. This menu is available at the top of a trending results window. The export will only pull data that is visible in the results window. This gives the user more control over the data they want by being able to utilize available data sets to help filter records. So when you open that drop down, you actually have a few options. The first being that you can export the trendables to a CSV file. This option will create a new file under a name and folder location that a user designates. The second option is to copy the entire table that you're looking at to the clipboard. This option is great if you need to pull data from Endline into an existing spreadsheet. So if you already have a document created in another system or you received a spreadsheet from another area and you only need to fill out a certain portion of the spreadsheet, you might want to use this feature. It's important while using the copy function to also be mindful of your data sets. This function will copy every field that is showing in the trending results window and cannot be modified until it is pasted elsewhere. The third option is to create a report. To do this, you have to already have your report templates set up, which we'll cover in a later class. When you click the export trendables to a CSV, the trendable export window will appear. So at the top, the user will select the folder location where they want to place the CSV file. They will also give the file a name. Next, they will choose what trendables they want to export. In Endline, you can utilize common Windows commands like Shift-Click or Control-Click to select data from the results window. This means you don't have to copy every single trendable that's in the data set. Next, the user will identify what fields they want to export. If there are any hidden trendable fields, they can select all to export those as well, or only the visible fields. A user can also export file attachments. So if a trendable or group of trendables have pictures or files attached to them, they'll be placed in a new folder called attachments in the same file location as a CSV. If there are multiple attachments on a single trendable, you can indicate what delimiter you want used inside the spreadsheet to separate those out. Similarly, if you have to export annotations about the model, a new folder called annotations will be created. An IGES file will be created and dropped into this folder for all trendables with a stored location. If there are any relations or comments, those can also be exported to the CSV file. So after all of your selections are made, you'll just hit OK. Here you can see the trendable fields saved in a CSV file. You can view these in Excel or whatever program you choose to use. Here you can see, even though the attachments and annotations were saved in different files, we still have references to them in the CSV. Okay, so next we're going to talk about importing trendables from a CSV. To do this, you'll click File, Insert Trendables. This opens the Trendable Insert dialog window. In this window, you'll need to choose the file that contains your trendables at the top. Once you do that, if you want to include file attachments, you will need to specify the character used as your delimiter. After all of that, you will need to check whether the file is valid by clicking validate at the bottom. So after you've run the validation, your results will populate in the window. Check for any errors that may need to be corrected. I also want to point out that the validation is checking to make sure the columns are being recognized. It's important that the fields you want to import your trendables into have valid column names within the CSV file. Otherwise, Endline won't know where to put them. The next step is just to import the data. Granted, all of your fields matched up and there were no errors, all of your records in the CSV should be inserted into the Endline database and ready to be used. Here you can see some of the specifics on how a CSV should be formatted. When you do this, it's important to include the asset type as well as the trendable type. Like I mentioned earlier, your column headers must match the field names in Endline. Also a side note before we move on, 
If you have coordinate information you want to put in, Endline can assign that information to the trendable based on the part number and the model provided to the system. There are a few more specific details I'm not going to get into right now. Just be aware that it can be done. Okay, so here we have an example problem. This is telling us to export the data of any five trendables. So the first step, we're going to open up Endline. And you can see we open right up to the model view. To do the export, we're going to need to open up a trending results window. So we'll do that up here at the top. Now I'm going to run my default data set. Remember, if I wanted to drill down into my data a little bit more, I can always use a new data set. We can just run it up here at the top, but I'm just going to use my default. Okay, so now I need to select five of my trendables that I'd like to export. Remember, we can either do a shift click or a control click if we want to. So I'm going to do a shift click here. And then if I hold control, I can click these three down here as well. Okay. So to export these, what I'm going to do is click our drop down menu up here at the top and hit export the trendables to a CSV file. Now up here at the top, I have the option to select the file location I want to drop these in. So in this case, I want it to be under my training classes, file export, that's fine. Next, I'm going to select which trendables I actually want to export. I don't want all of these, I just want the top five. I'm going to have all my visible trendable fields. It looks like it's the same number, so it doesn't really matter either way. I want to export any and all file attachments. My file attachments delimiter is going to be the semicolon here. I'm going to export my annotations and my comments. I'm going to hit OK. Now that screen will disappear. If I open up my file explorer here. I can see here we have the annotations and attachments folder as well as the CSV file that was created. If I open this up, we can see all of those trendables information. We have the trendable type over here, all the, uh, the data associated with it. If we scroll out to the side, we can see those annotations and attachments over here. Close this. And we have our two annotations and attachments folder. So if we go in here, we can see all of our attachments. We go into annotations, we can see those IGES files for trendables that have a location. So that's really the basics of exporting trendables. Okay, so now we're moving into our named regions. For those of you who aren't familiar, named regions are areas on a model that can be identified with a shape. These regions can be used in a trending query, and they are also helpful in visualizing areas on a model. They're also useful when setting up end check jobs that pertain to a specific area for inspections or defects, anything like that. To add a new named region, you'll just click File and then Named Regions. If you want to open or edit an existing named region, open the Named Region Management window by clicking Edit and then Named Regions. From inside the management screen, you can edit a selected region or delete one. You can also add a new named region from this screen as well. Adding a new named region will open the named region editor window. So from here, you can choose a shape that you would like to create. Each shape has their own characteristics, so be careful in your selection. Once the shape is selected, you can place it directly on the model by control clicking. In some cases, you can control click and drag to better define the shape. Once created, you can select the shape either from the layers tree on the left or the model view on the right. After you select the shape, you can manually edit its properties in the bottom left corner. These properties will be different depending on each shape. Okay, so we have another example problem here. This is asking us to create a small spherical named region at one of the bolt holes shown on the model. 
We then need to create a cuboid named region that bounds at least a 50 by 50 area of the deck. And then we're going to create a data set that finds all the trendables inside the cuboid region we just created. I'm going to open up NLine again. I want to add a new named region. So I'm coming up to edit named regions. And then to add a new named region, I'm just going to hit this plus sign here. That'll open up our named region editor. On the top left, you can see our layers tree, and on the right is our model. And I want to start by adding a sphere around a bolt hole. I know there are some bolts on the landing gear, so I'm going to manipulate the model like I normally would to find those bolt holes. Now I can see these pretty clearly. Now I want to place a sphere on one of these. So I'm going to come up here to the top and select my sphere shape. Now to place this, I'm just going to do a control click. So I'm holding control. I'm going to click on one of these bolts. And you can see our sphere show up on the, uh, the surface of our model here. Now I want to shrink this just a little bit, get a little bit more precise to our bolt hole. So if I were deselected on this to reselect the sphere, all I have to do is click on it in the model view and we have our properties over here. So this radius, I want to get a little bit closer to the size of that bolt hole. I'm going to take this down to 0 0.7. Five, hit enter, and you can see our sphere shrinks a little bit. You can get really precise with these if you want to. This is just an example, so I'm just going to leave it as is. I'm going to give this a name before we save this. Up here at the top, you'll notice we can name the region. Down here, we can name the actual shape. So if I wanted to put shapes on each of these bolt holes, I can do that and save it under one named region. I'm just going to have this one shape here, though. We'll call this week five sphere. We can add a description if we wanted to. And we have the ability to add these to an asset folder. OK, now this is going to be important when we go over setting up and check jobs as this will pertain a little bit more to it. So for now, I'm going to save this. We can see it shows up here in our named region management. So now we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to have a cuboid this time. I want it to sit on one of my wings, I believe. I'm going to add the new named region. So same thing here up at the top. I'm going to name this week five cube. I'm going to select my cube shape up here at the top. And then I'm going to place this on one of my wings. So I'm going to hold control, same as I was doing before, and click. Now that is pretty small. I need to make this a little bit bigger. I believe it said 50 by 50. So I'm going to change my length to 50, my width. And just for good measure, I'm going to do my height as well. Now, notice that you can also change the location or rotation of the shape in this property screen over here. So if I wanted to, I could rotate this along the X axis, uh, the Y axis, Z. Same with the locations. For right now, I'm just going to leave it where it is, though. So I'll hit save. And our week five cube shape shows up again in the named region management screen. OK. So now we're being asked to create a data set that will limit all of our trendables based on our named region. So to do that, I'm going to create a new data set. OK, so I'm going to add it up here. I'm going to give this a new name. We'll call this week five region now to add our named region to the data set over here 
all I need to do is come to our available fields on the left and double click where it says named region. And this screen should look familiar. It's all of the same information that we had in our named region management screen. I'm going to look for my cube, hit select. I'm going to run this. And we can see that we have some results down here. I'm going to save and close. Now I can run this up here at the top. I have my week five named region data set up at the top of our model view. Just hit update and you can already see a few trendables that were inside where that cube was. We also have some under here because the cube extended down. So we get all of this data as well. Okay. So I have a question about export trendable. So uh, if you go export trendable window, there are so many uh, fields. Let's say I just want to export out like the field that include date, part number, uh, type of trendable like crack and stuff, and I don't want the rest of the information. How do I uh, just limit the trendable that I want to export? So you can hide the columns here. If you right click up at the top, let's say I don't want that 202, you know, I don't want. Chris, go to the show lot. columns four. It's a little bit faster. Oh, the show, the columns show columns four, yes. Four. If you've got a specific trendable, uh, that, can, that can narrow it down. Go ahead and click on that. And then as you go to export, You can limit it to the visible turnable field. So as you configure what is displayed in the trending mm -hmm. results window, that's that option that he has checked right now in columns, only the visible trendable fields. So all the fields are 42 columns, and then just the visible ones are 19. Does that make sense? So let's say you only want, you said you only wanted, uh, what was it? like a date and and maybe crack length or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, so you could just, just have some type of identifier of the record, like a part number or record number, the date it was created, and then say crack, a uh, crack length displayed in the results window. And then as you click that, only export the visible trendable fields, you're only going to get whatever is displayed in the trending results window. That way you're not going to get every single field. Yep, that answered my question. Thank you. Great. Thank you. That was a great question.